The intent of this video is to discuss the various gear adopted by the B-17 bomber crew members. The B-17 bombers cruise at an altitude between 25 and 30,000 feet. Since the B-17 was unpressurized, uninsulated, and virtually unheated, the crew members were essentially on life support during these missions. To maintain life at high altitude, crew members breathe in supplemental oxygen. Without this supplemental oxygen, a human will become unconscious in about 60 seconds and die in 20 minutes. The bomber co-pilots conducted crew oxygen comms checks every 15 minutes, starting at the tail and working their way forward. If a crew member failed to respond, assistance could be provided. Crew members were instructed to hook up to one of the plane's four oxygen systems at altitudes at above 10,000 feet or at night. Crew members wore oxygen masks like this later A-14 on-demand model. The earlier generation inefficient continuous flow mass had a rebreather bag like observed in the Memphis Bell documentary. The oxygen hose was connected to an on-demand regulator. The oxygen regulator mixes pure oxygen with the cabin's ambient air to feed the correct mixture to the crew member. Each crew station contained a blinker gauge which provided a visual cue the oxygen system is flowing and a pressure gauge. The plane's oxygen system operated at 400 psi. The plane's oxygen system is supplied by 18 of the large G1 cylinder tanks. Each cylinder supplies about four hours worth of oxygen for one crew member. One or two of these smaller F1 tanks are attached to the ball turret framing. Each of these tanks provide about two hours of oxygen for the ball turret gunner, but the waste gunner could refill them in flight, tapping into the plane's oxygen system. The plane's oxygen tanks were constructed of a thin grade steel and were reinforced with longitudinal and hoop external tear straps. The tear straps function to arrest damage and cracks arising from battle damage. If an oxygen tank is penetrated, the oxygen will leak out in a controlled decompression. The damage will stay contained within the bays between the straps. No explosion of the tank will occur. Portable green walk-around bottles were scattered throughout the airplane. If a crew member needed to move about the cabin, he plugged these, his oxygen hose into a walk-around bottle and then clipped the bottle to his flak vest or parachute harness. The walk-around bottle has about eight minutes worth of oxygen and they are rechargeable in flight. If needed, a crew member could bring along a small H1 bailout bottle to keep from passing out during the freefall part of a bailout. The bailout bottle holster is attached to the crew member's leg or parachute harness. The cylinder is under high pressure around 1800 psi. To use the bottle, the crew member will remove the rubber feeder hose, bite on the hose and nipple, and breathe in continuous flow, 100% pure oxygen. No regulator is needed. Crew flak armor was introduced in spring 1943. An 8th Air Force Army study found that 85% of crew wounds were from low velocity projectiles like ground artillery flak and 20 millimeter cannon splinters. Only 15% of bomber crew wounds were actually caused by interceptor machine gun bullets. The crew's body armor system was designed to stop these low velocity projectiles, not machine gun bullets. The crew's armor is capable of withstanding a 45 caliber pistol bullet fired from about 30 feet. The crew armor system was credited for a 60% reduction in wounds. Crew members wore head protection like this M3 flak helmet. The helmet was based off of the standard U.S. Army issue M1 helmet. The M3 helmet contained its own suspension system, armored ear flaps to cover under the helmet's leather headset, and was flocked with a felt material. The flocking was added to protect the crew member's skin if it came in contact with the helmet at cold temperatures. Touching the steel with bare skin at low temperatures is extremely dangerous. Your hand will just stick to the metal. The flak vest and apron garments were fabricated with hundreds of overlapping 2 inch by 2 inch O36 steel plate inserts. The armor inserts were stoned into the vest and apron 
giving the garment some degree of flexibility. The apron is attached to the vest. The whole flat garment system could be detached from the crew member by a quick downward pull of the quick release cord. The flat garment system was actually too cumbersome for a parachute to be worn underneath. The entire flak armored system, including the helmet, weighed 25 pounds, 7 ounces. Crew members were exposed to extreme cold temperatures at minus 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. To combat this environment, crew members wore thick insulating layers, with the outer layers consisting of shearling fleece gloves, jackets, pants, and boots. The insulating layer was supplemented with a full-body electric suit, glove, and booties. The crew member plugged his electric suit cord into one of the plane's rheostats. The rheostats were located at the crew stations and were part of the plane's 24-volt DC electrical power system. The rheostats incorporated a dial so the crew member can fine-tune the seat's heat output. The early electrical suits were fabricated with brittle wiring and were notorious for shorting out and burning the crew members. To help combat the cold, some crew members wore silk scarves. Bomber gunners were always scanning the sky looking for those interceptors. Silk scarves helped to minimize shaping by acting as a barrier between their skin and the jacket's shearling collar. Crew members communicated through a throat microphone and generally adopted integrated headset receivers with their A11 leather helmet. The throat microphone was connected to a push-to-talk switch hanging off a lanyard around his neck. The push-to-talk switch and headset receivers were connected to one of the 12 communication jack boxes throughout the B-17. Underneath the flak vest, you will find a life preserver and a parachute harness. Crew members kept their chest parachutes close by their stations. If bailing out, it was a quick process to attach the parachute's buckles to the parachute harness's D-rings. Various types of goggles were adopted by bomber gunners. Goggle lens color was selected based on the type of environment expected. Dark green color works best in bright sunlight, amber in fog, and clear for nighttime flying. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel, World War II U.S. Bombers.